Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. and welcome back before we get into the episode just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast and all that means is that we are way behind where i'm at in patreon so if you are loving this podcast and you need more john constantine in your life definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books and sign up for the hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire hellblazer library that i've recorded so far and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the planes trains and comic books main podcast So if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 68, and you might notice some noise in the background of this one because it is storming pretty hard at my house, so uh, you might hear some thunder, some lightning, some rain sound. So I apologize for the rain if you guys can hear it. And just a little catch up on what happened in the last issue. John dealt with the fallout from the events of the previous story arc where a couple of goons went to Kit's house to try to beat her up just as a warning to John. And they only had one rule in their relationship, which was John is not supposed to bring the stuff that he gets into into their relationship or her life. So Kit and John got in a bit of a row and Kit ended up leaving. But it didn't stop there. John went to a pub during the day, got drunk, beat up some teenagers, Chaz just happened to be driving by, he saw this, and he saved John from a beating from the bar owner, and when he took John back to Kit's now empty flat, uh, they had a bit of a talk, but then it ended with Chaz telling John he was an asshole, and Chaz beating the hell out of him. So it seems John Constantine is all alone now, he has no friends, no girlfriend, and that is where we're picking up in issue 68, so first things first with the cover. We see London in the background, and in some of the London streets, you can see John is drinking and leaning against a wall, and it's during the day, which is always a good sign. And then in the foreground, we see a vampire leaning against a tree, looking like an 80s vampire, like the ones from The Lost Boys. Uh, He's got a leather jacket, he's got jean pants on and a white undershirt. And then there are two other vampires that are in front of him that look a bit more like traditional vampires. They just look stoic but their eyes are red and they look like they just fed because blood is running down one of their mouths. And we see that this is written by Garth Ennis with art by Steve Dillon. And we start off on the first page and we see there's kind of like a vignette of a bunch of different homeless people around the city. And the first panel has two men in it and the narration says, here they are then. There's William Kelly from Cork and the weasel with him living in a Kilbourne squat till some team of bastards kicked them out. Kelly was stamping on the second fellow's balls when the third one sapped him. His head's not been right since. Then we get a panel of a woman who is begging for change in the subway tunnel. And the narration over her panel says, We Sue, who bit a copper's half ear off him down the dilly. Frigger deserved it. And in the next panel, we're seeing two more men that are different from the first panel. And one of them is holding their face like they're in pain. And the other one is struggling to open a can of tomatoes. And the narration continues. The Millwall crew, with Andy severely doubting he can keep these bastard tomatoes down from the look of them, and Curahan spitting the teeth and blood it took to open the can. Then we come to the last panel on the page, and we see a single man sleeping on the ground. His back is towards the camera, so we can't see a face or anything, just a brown trench coat. And the narration continues. Thousands more just like them, brittle lives of cold and sickness, leaning on iron, sleeping on stone, Soft things forgotten, piss from the sky, brick wall endings. And all we can offer are a hundred smug or nervous litanies. It's not my responsibility. The social services should sort it out. That's what they're there for. Even if I gave some bloke a quid, well, that doesn't really solve it in the long run. So next to that narration and also for the rest of the narration, there's a couple panels where a young man is walking down the sidewalk and he makes eye contact with a beggar And then he looks away quickly, and then we see the beggar close his eyes and just looking like he's kind of given up because he has no hope. And the narration continues. Facing the truth is bloody hard, especially when it's, all right, mate, 
I'm doing pretty well at the minute, and you sitting penniless in the gutter is what's keeping me that way. That's the way it goes, huh? Only so much to go around, not enough for everyone. Tough old life. Tough old lives. Thousands of them. And under that last narration of thousands of them, we see a man from the back who looks kind of familiar, but that is confirmed as we turn the page that it is John Constantine. He is currently living on the streets. Because as you remember, when Kit left, she had only paid up through the week. So John only had a week to stay at that place. So I guess after that, he went to go live on the streets. So we get some more close-ups of him and he's drinking out of a whiskey bottle. And it definitely looks like it's been longer than a week because John's hair has grown out along with his beard. So he's not the usual suave John Constantine. And the narration says, this one's been on the street since summer. Won't say why. Bit of a git. Nasty. Icy wee eyes. Piss artist too. Hasn't hit the meths yet, but give it time. December now. And a bloke like him will drink anything to keep out of the cold. His name? I think it's John. And then we see John finish the last of the alcohol in his bottle. And he says, shit. And we see the name of this issue is called Down All the Days. Then we cut to a place, uh, I think we've seen it before, but it was all the way back in issue 50. And that place is the lair of the King of the Vampires. And it basically just looks like a cave. There's a bunch of stalactites and stalagmites all over the place. There's also a bunch of skulls and human bones uh, that are piled up on one side. It's probably their like garbage pile. And in the middle of the room, there is a large pool of water. And there are some steps that are carved into the rock that are leading to that pool from an outside tunnel. And currently in the room, we can see four people, two women who are uh, near the bone pile who are eating. And then there's two men, one who's in the shadows and one who's sitting on the stairs, looking at the weird fish inside of the pool. That kind of remind me of <laughs> the worm that Ursula turns King Trident into in the animated Disney movie, The Little Mermaid. So the man we can see who's sitting on the steps is saying, I don't like the look of those fish. And the man in the shadows says, Oh, Darius, you're not still believing in that nonsense, are you? And Darius replies, I just don't know. They're thrashing about there like someone put speed in their marrow food. Look at them. Their eyes are bulging. It must mean something after what happened to Jimmy. And the man in shadows replies, Jimmy was young and stupid, that's all. He dropped 500 tabs before going hunting and staying out after dawn because... He dug the colors, and he got sunburnt. That's all there is to it. And as he says this last line, uh, we see the man from the shadows move to where the light from the pool is reflecting off his face, and we recognize this man once we see him as the king of the vampires. So as he stands up, Darius says, If you say so, shall we go then? Then the two men turn and begin to walk up the stairs and out of the tunnel, and as they do, the king of the vampires says, Yes, I'm parched. London, I think. A little smoky aftertaste, I know. But I like the lights. And Mary's in town. And Darius says, Good. And then he gets a little smirk on his face, like if he was thinking a joke to himself. And the King of the Vampires asks, Going to share the joke? And Darius answers, Oh, it's just an idea I've been toying with. A rather delicious one, actually. I was going to pop over to Buckingham Palace and take a pint out of Big Ears. Can you imagine him tomorrow morning? I say, I have quite an overpowering urge to drink fresh blood. It really is appalling. Summon a virgin at once. And the king of the vampires jokingly comments, Let's see him find one of those in Buckhouse. And then Darius begins to get excited, and he walks a little bit faster than the king of the vampires, and he says, I can't wait. And the king of the vampires says, You mean you're not joking? And then Darius stops and turns around questioningly and says, Why not? And the King of Vampires kind of smiles to himself and says, Darius, Darius, Darius. He's royalty, is he not? Inbred, old friend. I think he's actually his uncle's. It'd be like drinking red water. No body to it at all. Besides, I'm told he's been utterly insane since the Calabraxis possession. They keep him in a rubber room. And they won't let him out in public without enough Valium in him to floor a whale. So just in case you didn't pick up on it, they're talking about drinking the blood of Prince Charles, who in the story arc called Royal Blood got possessed by a demon called Calabraxis and went on a killing spree cutting up people like Jack the Ripper. 
And I believe that was in like issues 52 to 57 maybe or something like that. So as the King of the Vampires finishes explaining this, Darius kind of looks disappointed and he says, oh, well, shame. You just don't think of these things. And then the King of the Vampire reaches out and puts his arm on Darius's shoulder and then they continue to walk out of the tunnel and the King of the Vampire says, evidently not. You just leave the thinking to me. Then we cut to John Constantine, who is standing on a sidewalk begging for money. So he's got his hand outstretched and he's saying, can you give us some change? I'm hungry. Can you give us 20p? And then one man walks by John and John asks him, give us a quid, mate. And the man doesn't say anything. He just kind of side eyes John as he walks by. And John says, wanker. And behind the man that walked by him, we see a couple walking, a man and a woman. And the man is looking at John like he's about to do something mischievous. And we see him reach into his pocket and he pulls out some coins and he holds out his palm and says, here you go, mate. And as John reaches out towards the coins, the man purposefully tips his hand so they fall onto the ground and John kneels down to pick them up. And as John does that, the woman is saying, Stuart, that's horrible. And Stuart replies, ah, oh, relax. Look at him. He don't care. Sad git. And John doesn't say anything to him. He just picks up the money. And then we cut to John walking into a corner shop. And the clerk sees John enter and says, ah, here's a man in for a pit stop. What'll it be then, sir? Rymot? Montrose? A light Chablis? We have an excellent Friscotti. Quite a presumptuous little fellow. Or how about trying the Australian? They do a marvelous Cabernet Sauvignon. And what's going on here is this clerk has looked at John and judged him based on his looks that he doesn't have any money. So he's making fun of him by offering him a bunch of expensive types of wines. And John doesn't really acknowledge this. He just approaches the counter with a handful of coins and says, give me a friggin' bottle. And the man responds, a budget buyer? Might I suggest Buckfast, sir? Or always one to amuse the palate. How about a bottle of Mundy's? But no, as you're obviously a discerning chap and definitely not likely to be found drinking paint stripper out of a dead soldier's arse, I'll let you in on my best kept secret. And then he reaches out to the shelves behind him and the clerk pulls out a bottle of lighter fluid and he holds it out to John with a big shit eating grin on his face and he says, it really is the thinking alcoholic's tipples, sir. Then we cut to dusk and the sun has just gone under the horizon and we're getting a shot of the London Bridge over the Thames River. And we hear the King of the Vampires say, I wonder. Then we cut to the top of one of the towers of the London Bridge. And we see three men up there, Darius and the King of the Vampires, and a naked man who's tied to an iron girder who looks terrified. And he's saying, not me, not me, not me. And Darius, who's standing next to this man, says, shut up. And then he turns to the King of the Vampires and asks, what do you wonder? And we see the King of the Vampires is not standing next to them. He is just looking out over London with his back to Darius. And he says, I wonder what's happened to Constantine. And I'm just going to interject right here that if you don't remember what happened between John and the King of the Vampires, you can go read or listen back to issue 50, which I'll just kind of briefly paraphrase here. But basically, the King of the Vampires sent John a message to meet him in a park and then John went in the middle of the night to go there and he met the King of the Vampires who offered John a deal of basically being a familiar and John ended up turning him down and kind of making fun of him. So that is why the King of the Vampires is kind of looking out thinking about John now that they're in London. So Darius says to the King of the Vampires, you, uh, you always get upset when you think about him, my lord. Let's not spoil a perfect evening. And the King of the Vampires doesn't turn around. He just says, it's as if he was never there. No one's seen him or heard from him. I was foolish when I met him. I didn't really understand the man at all. I wanted him as a spy. I should have kept clear of him upon reflection. I told him great things were in the offing. I didn't mention he was responsible. Hell is in chaos. The devil neglects his domain. His brothers are almost hermits, and no one dares tell him his hate for Constantine will be his undoing. And then Darius begins to walk towards the King of the Vampires and says, why don't you tell him? And the King of the Vampires replies, because I couldn't care less one way or the other. We've never really gotten on. He sees me as a useless hedonist, a dandy who meddles with the world for my amusement. 
I see him as a useless antique. And then out of nowhere, a woman shows up and says, Pondering the grand design again, my lord? And the king of the vampires turns and sees her and he smiles and says, Mary. And then he walks up to her and he asks, And what have you been up to? And she replies, Just the usual depravity. Cindy sends her love, but is occupied with the Israelites. A pity. I think tonight will be wonderful. And then she turns to the frightened, tied up man and says, And I see you brought something to drink. And the man looks terrified as she says this. And I should probably describe all of them because I don't think I have so far. So all three vampires are white. Darius looks like he's supposed to be pretty young, maybe in his early 20s. And he's got long blonde hair that he keeps in a ponytail. The king of the vampires looks a little bit older, but pretty similar to Darius. And he has short brown hair that's kind of slicked back on his head. And both the men are wearing pretty simple clothes like just regular shirts or undershirts and jeans. But Mary is just wearing a corset for a top and she's wearing jeans and she has really thick curly black hair that goes down to the top of her back. So Mary walks over to the terrified man and he's like, ah, ah, as she gets closer and she kind of smiles and says, so much less intrusive when they're silent. How has the night gone for you? And in the background, we can see that Darius and the King of the Vampires are taking off their shirts and the King of the Vampires answers her saying, well enough, a derelict each across the river. Mine was drunk and tasted of vodka. Darius took his against a fence before biting. Impetuous boy. And then Mary reaches out a finger on her hand towards the tied up man's neck and we see her begin to slit his throat with her fingernail. And as she does this, she says, really Darius? Sometimes I think you'd put it up anything. And then Darius walks over to the King of the Vampires and he begins to rub his chest. And he says to Mary, a suspicion I will now happily confirm for you. And then Mary brings her mouth to the wound on the man's neck and she sucks in a giant gulp like her cheeks are full of blood. And then without swallowing, she turns around and walks towards the King of the Vampires and Darius who are making out. And as Darius kisses down the King of the Vampires chest, she walks over to his face and begins to spit blood out of her mouth into the King of the Vampire's mouth and it drips down onto his chest where Darius is licking it up. And we get a full splash page of that image so we get some really good vampire eroticism if that's your thing in this one. Then we cut to John Constantine who is walking into an abandoned building and this must be where he stays regularly because there's a mattress on the ground. And it's not like a new mattress or anything. It looks like it was trash or something and he just dragged it in here. So as he walks in, I don't know if he's talking to himself or, or if he hears someone, but he says, yeah. And then he sits down on the mattress and pulls out a flask and he says, oh, bloody hell. Huh? And as John looks up, he sees a man walk through the same broken wall he just walked through. And the man is saying, come on, man, give us a break. This is my place. And John says, bullshit. And the man says, no, man, it is. And John replies, piss off. Where's your, your freaking gear? And the man begs, look, man, I just found this place an hour ago. I went to get all me stuff, all right? But John tells him, sling your hook, bollocks, which is slang that means go away. So the man looks sad because, you know, he lost his place for the night. So he looks down disappointed and he says, oh, shit. He looks back up at John and he still tries to reason with him and he says, well, well, there's no reason why we can't both stay here, is there? There's loads of room. And John tells him, I don't give a monkeys. The mattress is mine. Then the man gets an idea and he begins to search through his bag and he says, I've got a blanket. We can share the mattress, man. And we can share the blanket. I've got to nip out for a bit, but when I'm back, that's what we'll do, right? And John begrudgingly says, right. And then John brings his bottle up to his mouth and begins to drink. And the man sees this and says, it's friggin' freezing, man. How about a swig? And John looks very angry at this and he says, piss off, it's not in the deal. So the man walks away and he says, fair enough, man, I'll see you later. And he leaves his things with John next to the bed and he walks off. Then we cut back to the London Bridge with the vampires and we see they've made a bloody mess of the man that they brought there to drink. In fact, all that's left of him is his head that is, you know, has its skin and stuff on it. But the rest of his body is just bits of muscle and viscera and blood on his bones. And Darius is holding up the man's head and he's saying, was it good for you too? <laughs> and the King of Vampires is amused watching him. But Mary seems like this is a little excessive. So she yells out, Darius. And Darius turns around and says, 
<laughs> to relax, Mary. So I tend to get a little wild. What's next? And then the king of the vampire walks over to Mary and he looks at her and says, Well, I need to replace the three or four pints this little harlot took out of me. I shall see you both back here an hour from dawn, shall we say? So the king of the vampires leaves and Mary turns to Darius and says, And what shall we do? And a very bloody and naked Darius says to her, Well, I'm prepared to offer you the chance to look this blood off me down to the last drop. And then she turns away from him like she's disgusted and he says, No? In that case... I shall find myself a few pregnant females and turn to mist and drink the blood of infants in their wombs. And you can definitely tell that Darius is getting excited by the thought of all the different possibilities. Then we cut to John Constantine who is vomiting and luckily he's not on his mattress at the moment. He has walked over to a broken window, uh, but he's not throwing up outside of that. He's still in the building as he vomits. And as he's throwing up, John's narration says, been better off with the lighter fluid. And then he holds his head as he finishes and leans against the wall and his narration continues. Head clears just for a moment. Don't want that. Can't help it. How do I get to this? Every time I get lucid, I ask that. Every time the answer gets further away. And we see now that John is sobering up, he's remembering how he got here. So he pictures Chaz getting really angry at him and about to punch him. And John's narration continues. But I know. I did my usual trick. Took something good and made it rotten. And then Chaz's face disappears and it turns into Kit's face and she's yelling at him as well. And his narration says, took love and made it into hate. And then John cries out, Kit. And then he begins to cry. And then he tries to push that away by getting angry and he yells out, you bitch, you freaking bitch. And then he goes back over to his mattress and his senses come back to him and he says, oh no, 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 you weren't. You were so bloody good to me. Oh, love, no. And then he reaches out to the bottle that's sitting next to the bed and he begins to drink it as fast as possible. And his narration says, and everything was just, it was pointless. All the planning and dealing so I'd be safe with her and it collapsed like a sodden pack of cards. And then we get a little flashback of what happened directly after the last issue where he was laying on a gravestone in the rain and we see him sitting up the next morning and then walking, and then walking past a wine and liquor store. And the narration over these panels says, And after that, why bother? I could have gone to someone, got help, Rick, or up to Glasgow to see Hedder, even Bloody Nige. But it was just, why bother? Why bother? Why bother? Like everything else I do, I could have been something brilliant, could have flown. And then we cut back to John in the present, and he's staring at his bottle that's almost empty now, and he's saying to himself, stop bloody membrane. And then his narration says, but I'd rather crawl on the shit. Then as John is staring at his liquor bottle, the man from before the other homeless guy comes in and says, all right, man, it's just me. And John replies, think I give a shit. So the man sits down next to John on top of the bed and pulls the blanket over him and John. And they're both leaning their backs against a brick wall that is directly behind the mattress. So as the man sits on his butt, he yells out, Jesus, my ring piece. And in case you didn't know, he's saying that his asshole is hurting. And then he turns to John and looks at the bottle and says, so you got the blanket sorted. You gonna give us some of that then? And John yells at him, no, I bloody told you. And the man looks kind of sad and he says, suit yourself, man. You could do with it. Feels like I've had a tree trunk up me. And upon hearing that, John kind of softens and looks over to him and says, you've been selling your arse? And the man says, yep. And then preemptively, the man says to John, I won't give you any diseases, man. Don't worry. And John says to him, I'm not. What, what happened? And the man answers, this toff picked me up down Tottenham Court Road, back to his place. Nearly ripped me arse out of me. Then he brings this bloody great Alsatian in, and he just stands there and smiles at me. I was friggin' out the door before the bastard could blink, man. Only problem was, I didn't get paid, and I wanted to pick up some grub, you know? I'm Davy, by the way. And John replies, uh, I'm John. And before we move further, I just want to make sure everybody understood that story. Out of desperation, Davy has become a prostitute and he got picked up by a man who apparently roughly had his way with him. And then he brought out an Alsatian, which is another word for German shepherd. So he was wanting either Davy to have sex with the dog or the dog to have sex with Davy. So it was a pretty messed up situation he was in there. But this story being so messed up seems to have softened John. And John begins to talk to him saying, down from Sheffield? And Davy replies, 
Right, man. You Scouse? And John answers, long time ago. And Davy continues, yeah, I came down to work, you know, after college. Some bloody hope. And Dole, you need an address, right? How are you meant to get a place without cash? Jesus. And I believe Dole is the slang term for government assistance. So he's talking about how he came down here and couldn't get a job. And he couldn't even get Dole because you have to have an address to receive that. And John starts to say something like he's going to ask how he jumped from that to becoming a sex worker. And Davey anticipates this and says, but becoming a rent boy? Bloody tell us about it, man. You'd be surprised. It's not so bad being the lowest freaking form of life. At least it means you can't get any lower. And as Davey says this, John looks down at his bottle and whatever's left in it, he decides to hand over to Davey. Then we cut to an alleyway close by where the king of vampires has turned into a big wolf and he's stalking through the alleyway and he's walking towards a homeless man. And the homeless man wakes up and he's drunk and he says, what's that? And then he sees the wolf and he says, fuck me, fucking great big dog. And surprisingly, the wolf actually walks up to him and it doesn't attack. It just starts licking his hand. And the homeless man says, that's a good boy. That's a lad. Only living things have been good to me all day, boy. God love you, Yar. And then as he begins to pass out again, he mumbles, As a boy, you stick with Billy, and we'll be maids. Best maids. And as he falls asleep, we see the wolf turn into the king of the vampires. And then as we turn the page, we see him walking out of the alley, and there's a stream of blood beginning to form behind him where the homeless man was sleeping, so we can assume he killed that homeless man. And then as he's walking, it's like he almost gets a sense of something. Like he's walking and then all of a sudden he turns like something caught his attention. But there was no noise or anything like that. So it's got to be like a sixth sense. So we see him turn and see a broken wall and a window that's broken as well. And he walks in and we see a doorway that looks exactly like the one John had walked through. And as he walks in, he sees John and Davey cuddled up sleeping next to each other. And he stands over them and he gives a big smile. And that is the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.